Come, follow me. That's the words he told to Simon and his brother Andrew. And on hearing that, they dropped what they were doing, the casting of the nest or fishing, and they followed him. But what does that mean for you and for me today? Come follow me. If you consider yourself a serious disciple or follower of Yeshua or desire to be, you don't want to miss this lesson because we're going to talk about four practices that Yeshua did that we should follow, just as he mentioned. Sure, there could be many more, but I believe these four practices will seriously put us on the right track. So stay tuned here. Before, but before I go any further, I want to look at or remind us that this is a the third part of a three-part series on discipleship, the truth about following Yeshua. It's important that we not just throw around terms like Christian and disciple, not truly understanding what they mean, and coming up with our own definitions and, and uh, lifestyle and practices. But let's re go back to the Bible to see what it says. So it's a three part series. Part one is the cut where we talk about who can't be a disciple according to Yeshua. Do we make the cut? How can we modify? How can we change? How can we repent in any areas to make sure we are in that fold? And part two talks about the cost. What is the cost? Is there a cost? And we, we mentioned that the cost is everything if we're going to follow Yeshua. And lastly, today is the call. He is calling each one of us to follow him. But what does that actually mean? My, if you haven't been to this channel before, my name is Brandon Clayton. Um, this channel is all about learning, loving, and applying the word of God to our life today. How can we do that? If this is the kind of uh, uh, instruction, encouragement, conviction, um, whatever it is for you, if this is what you're looking for, make sure you subscribe, make sure you like and share so we can keep um, sharing this content and you'll be privy to it as soon as it comes out. So the questions we want to answer today, two questions. One is today, how can we appropriately respond to Yeshua's call to follow him? <laughs> now we saw what the disciples did, whether it be dropping their nets, leaving their father in the boat. Um, we, 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 we saw them calling, but in the 21st century, for us today, what does that mean? What does that look like? We want to look at four actions that Yeshua left as an example for us to follow if we are to be his disciples. What are those four actions that we must embrace also if we say we're following him? Since by definition, um, disciple means to be a learner or a follower, and we know that's how, how they... Um, interacted with each other at this time and he calls us to do the same now for the first one let's jump into it except that you can do nothing without God's authority I know I know you can do nothing without I mean tell any man you can't do nothing you can do nothing without God would you tell me I can't do nothing it just stirs up something inside of me that want to show you tell me I can't do something watch me I can he says you have to accept that you can do nothing without God's authority. Why? Because this is what Yeshua did. In John chapter 5, he says, Yeshua gave them, um, in John chapter 5, verse 19, Yeshua gave them this answer. Very truly, I say to you, the son can do how much? Nothing. Nothing by himself. How many of us have gone through this life have gone through our Christian walk with an attitude that I don't need you. I don't need anybody. Right. And and it, and it, and we think that it's just with people, but we have that attitude with God. I don't need him. I can do this. And we don't say it with that attitude, but it shows up in our actions. The son says, I can do nothing by myself. He can do only what he what sees the father doing. I'm literally going to watch the footsteps of my father in heaven. And that's what I'm going to do. And in this case, I'm going to watch the footsteps of the one who's watching the father, which is Yeshua. He gave us a clear example of how to engage with uh, temptation, with rid being ridiculed, uh, with walking in righteousness. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Think about that. Whatever the father does, the son also does. If we share no other passage, if we share no other scripture, that is worth meditating on right there. Is that my heart? 
Is that my mind? Is that my life and my actions? That I have an attitude that says I can do nothing by myself. I only do what I see the Father doing, and I only uh, uh, and whatever the Father does, that's what I do as well. Is that my attitude? Is that your attitude? If that's not your attitude, that has to be corrected and changed. And we can know whether or not it's attitude oftentimes because we will go without God. We will leave the house having not prayed, having not uh, um, read anything, having not meditated. We would make big decisions without sitting at the feet, feet in counsel of Yahweh. We just go about our life doing our thing and say, oh, maybe I should pray. Do I really need? I don't live a life of saying I need him. Does my life show that I am dependent upon watching what he does? And the part that's implied here is that you have to sit at his feet very closely and watch very closely in order to know what he's up to. Am I doing that? In John uh, five, a few verses later, he says, I can do nothing on my own. I can't do anything on my own. You know, this idea of doing nothing on our own. Like I said, it, it can conjure up our pride, our ego. You know, um, as a matter of fact, it feels incompetent to think that as a man, I can do nothing on my own. <laughs> Would you? I can do something. I can walk. I can stand. I can put this lesson together. I can say hi. I can say bye. What do you mean? I can't do nothing. There's a humility that is de- that is uh, demanded for every person who is a disciple and a follower that says, "No, I can't. I'm not going to go any." take one step more without his counsel, without understanding his spirit on this matter. Even the Holy Spirit would not speak without Yahweh. How do we know? Because we see it. We see it here in John chapter 16. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the, all the truth, for he will not speak what on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak. Again, we hear this, whatever. Whatever he hears, that's what he's going to say. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. The Holy Spirit is at the bidding of Yahweh's call. Yeshua himself, the Son of God, who's come down in the flesh, is at the bidding of what Yahweh wants him to do. Whatever he wants, whatever he says, wherever he goes, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to tell you right now, as we talked about in the previous lesson, when we talked about counting the cost and we talked about those who can't be a Christian. The challenge is there are going to be times when it does not feel good. Well, we want to go one way. and He wants to go a different way. And we have to say, no, I have to go his way. It'll behoove us to ask ourselves these two questions. If you get nothing else from this lesson, this would be enough. It would behoove us if we call ourselves disciples and followers, not just those who go to church and read the Bible and believe what he's done and believe that the Bible is true and believe. See, that that has a place, right? James talks about the demons believe that there's a God, and they should. <laughs> but disciples actually follow him and follow what he's done. And like Yeshua and the Holy Spirit, they watch and they imitate what they see. Two questions we should ask. One, do I do only what I see my father doing? Ask yourself that right now. This is what I see my father doing. Whether it's, it's been done before or I can see it in the same spirit and the same principle, this is what I see my father doing. I tell you, asking that question will keep you from a whole lot of sin. Asking that question will keep you from a whole lot of temptation. It would help gray areas become very clear because you ask that and says, is this what I see my father doing? You see my father being, I see my father being patient. I see him being loving. I see him being stern and and passionate about what's true. I see him not being lazy, getting up early, sometimes going to bed late, but doing his work and committing himself to that. I see him doing, I see Yeshua doing that here in the flesh. And the second question is, do I only speak according to his authority in mine or do I speak according to mine? Do I speak according to his authority or mine? See, the Holy Spirit only spoke what he was given by the father. 
There are too many teachers and preachers and um, Christians and um, followers who are very loose in how they speak. Very loose in how they speak and not realizing sometimes that we carry the name of Yeshua on us. And we don't want to take that in vain. We can't. We have to be careful saying God told me or this is God's spirit or this is what he wants us to do. Am I speaking according to the authority he's given me to speak? You know, I have a friend of mine that always talks about that's above my pay grade. I cannot speak on things that I don't know. He has not made that clear to me. I cannot say this is what what God is thinking or why he did such and such or if that was him at all. I just have to say that's above my pay grade. He has not given me authority to speak on such matters, even on your life. It's so tempting, right? In our culture, you hear preachers talk about uh, God's going to do this and he's going to do that. And here, let me tell you why this and that is happening. Did he give you authority to speak on those matters? Be very careful. The Holy Spirit wouldn't open his mouth and move any man unless it became clear that this is what God wants it, wanted to do. Yeshua wouldn't do that. Yet somehow we have the audacity. We have the intelligence to say, I got it. I get it. And we have so much confidence having spent so little time with Yahweh in comparison to Yeshua. As we'll see here in, in just a moment toward the end of this is Yeshua spent great amounts of time with him and had a lot of clarity. Most of us don't spend that much time at the feet of Yeshua. Yet we have so, make so many claims and so many boasts about what we see through him. We, we must be careful. Not that we can't say anything, but this is the first attitude. We must admit, I can do nothing. I can speak nothing unless my father has enabled me to do so. What kind of people speak on their own authority? What kind of people speak? Oh no, Yeshua answered that question in John chapter 7. He says, the one who speaks on his own authority, you know what he's doing? He's seeking his own glory. And that's what's happening. Let's just be honest. You know, it sounds real good to say this is going to be that way. And I proclaim this and that. And this is how it's going to be. And God told me and the Lord this and that. It, it, you're speaking on your if you're speaking from your own authority, you're seeking your own glory. Well, it makes you look good. Right. Um, we got to be careful with that. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true. And in him, there is no falsehood. We cannot speak on our own authority. What does that mean practically? I try very hard to make sure I'm using the scriptures as a foundation for any claim that I'm putting forth. And that's why you see all my slides inundated with verse after verse, verse after verse. Instead of just one or two scriptures in the hour of uh, motivational speaking, I want to be grounded in what did he actually say? Is this a principle that is, I can show from this passage to that passage from beginning to end? OK, now I can comfortably say this is a pattern. We must also have um, diligence in how we're handling his word and the 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 um, the ideas that he's putting in our hearts and our minds. Be careful that we're not speaking on our own authority. Um, I'm I'm trying hard not to make up anything and say, well, this is what I think and what I feel and what I'm trying hard unless there's a lot of scriptures to support them. This is why it's important to establish every truth claim in the word of Yahweh, not our opinions not our philosophies, not our cultural biases. This is really tough because when you grow up a certain way in a certain country, you know, I talk about America a lot. You have a lot of American ideas. If you grow up in another country, um, this is the idea. If you grow up in a certain kind of family, um, this is how we always do things. This is how we see. You, you tend to see through a certain type of lens and you tend to want to see scripture and the world through that lens. But you have to submit to God's authority in his scriptures that may not show that. We have to realize that we're reading through a whole different lens when we open up scripture, not our own. Um, through a, 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 a Israelite community, a Hebrew community, a Jewish community, far removed from where we are today. A government that was unlike what we have. There's so many things different we have to detach ourselves from to make sure we're upholding his spirit appropriately. How much does Yahweh say disciples can do on their own? In John chapter 15, he says, Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in a vine, 
neither can you. He said, just like the branch, you can't bear unless you remain in me. I am the vine. In case you were wondering who is who, I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides, that means lives, that means to remain, that means to continue to walk in. Abides in me and I in him. He it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. And that makes sense when we use the illustration of a tree and a branch. Because we understand you cut that branch off and lay it on the ground. Eventually, it's just going to, I mean, it starts dying as soon as you cut it off. It has no more nutrients. The water flow, the nutrients and everything is gone. This is how it is in his body. We must understand this and stay closely connected to him. I have to have the sustenance. I have to feed on his word and his nutrients. This is not an option or something I can just get by on. Too many of us have done that and thinking that um, I'm, a, I'm a believer and I can do most of this by myself. No, I have to have it if I'm going to produce good fruit. The first practice we must embrace in order to follow Yeshua is to realize we can do nothing without him. We can do nothing without him. We need to watch carefully like he watched his father. We need to watch carefully the father and his footsteps that he left for us in scriptures. What did he actually do? Because I, I, I don't want to come up with this. I don't want to depend on my own strength, my intelligence to try to get me through. We need to be like Yeshua, who says I can do nothing. I only speak according to what he's, what's been given. Number two, seek his own will, his will, not your own. Seek his will, not your own. All right, this is a tough one. This is the same vein, but we need to seek his will, not your own. Why? Because that's what Yeshua did. John chapter 6, he says, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but what? The will of him who sent me. Can we say that? I have not come here to do my will. I've only come to do the will of him who sent me. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, you have to first admit you have a will. I have a desire. I have wishes and wants that are not that are different than Yahweh's. These are not two. These are not the same thing. Yeshua had a different will. And we see that in the Garden of Gethsemane where he says, may this cup be taken from me. But he aligned his will with his father. He didn't demand that his father align with him. He says, I uh, the will of him who sent me is what I do, not my own. I do acknowledge knowledge that I have a will, but I'm not going to do that. Will you give up that? And it's part of the deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. So we're going deeper in that now and saying, if you want to be a follower, now that you, you've committed that, you repented, you were baptized, it means that I need to actually follow him and say, your will be done. I feel like sleeping, but I need to get up. I feel like getting up, but I need to rest. I feel like saying something, but I need to bite my tongue. I need to say your will be done here and not lean on my own understanding. Notice how how consumed he is with his father will. Look at verse 39. And this is the will of him who sent me. See, I, he knows what this will is. This is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my father. This is my father's will. That everyone who looks on his son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. He is consumed with his father's will. He doesn't want to do anything else. And he recants his own. He says, this is what I, not only is this his will back up a little bit. He has to know what that will is. Many did not get in because Yeshua says, I don't know you because you did not do my father's will. Well, I had the Bible. I went to church. I, I did this commandment. I, that's not my father's will. To understand his will, you need to have the scriptures, obviously. Be in prayer. But listen to what he is calling for you to do. Watch Yeshua. Give up your will and say, I'm going to follow you instead. 
What did Yeshua do? Doing the will of Yahweh was not simply something that Yeshua did out, out of obedience. It was a very sustenance that he depended on for his life. Let me say that again. He depended on it. He, he looked at it as literally food that I eat. Most of us can look at doing his will as something I need to do or I really should do rather. But not something I have to do because it's how I it's my food. And that, but that's how he looked at it. This is my food. What did Yeshua say his spiritual food was? Yeshua said to them, my food is to do what? It is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. That's what I eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. What you eat? He said, that's my food. I'm eating that every day. Can you imagine going without eating for a meal or two? Oh, my goodness. The whole day you are going to know you're going to be hurting. Sometimes you intentionally fast. Amen. But you know it. You're not going to accidentally forget. Oh, yeah, I forgot to eat. You're going to be hurting. In this case, we desire food. When we're hungry, we want to eat. Do we go hours and say, man, I, I, what is this? We, I, I, I want to do it. I want to feed on it. If we want to be like Yeshua and follow him, we need to desire to do his will. God's will, not our own. And this is what he models for us here. What makes Yeshua's judgment just going back to his will again? I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. Why? Because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He doesn't have a personal agenda here. He says, I'm only going to do what God says. And since we know that God is true, he's just, he's right. He's all the things that we aspire um, to be in holiness. He says, I'm just doing what he wants. Sometimes things get muddy when we put what we want in there. He says, no, I just want to do his will. That's it. I'm not trying to promote my selfish ambition agenda and say this is something. No, no, no. Just going to do his will. That's why my judgment is just and it's right. And we can have make right judgments as well when we are consumed by that's his will. Even if it means us looking bad, even us, even if it means us being talked about or not put in the great light. That's what his will is. That's what we want to do. Because sometimes we can often skew the intent and interpretation of God's word to ensure it aligns with our own biblical worldview, as we mentioned before. But he says, no. What does he want? That's what we do. Well, I don't want to upset anybody, but that's his will. Well, that's going to be uncomfortable if I move to that city. That's going to be painful if I lose that money or income. All these things that we have a dog in that fight that says, no, it's going to hurt. He says, no, no. What's his will? I want to submit to his kingdom and his will. How can we know? How can we know whether or not a teaching is from God in the same way, which is not surprising? John 70 says, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. He says, you'll be given discernment because your will is to do God's will. So you'll be able to see more clearly like, oh, OK, I only want to do God's will instead of it being a fog because we're battling between what we want and what he want. And notice it didn't say you'll be able to understand God's will because you're biblically astute. You're very intelligent. You have degrees. You've read it many times. He says, no, you have a surrendered heart that says, uh, my will is to do God's will is what's going to give you the discernment. So he will know not because he diligently just study or people pat him on, uh, on his or her back and saying, yeah, okay, you're really smart at that. But no, I really want to do his will. He gives you the perspective to see. Yeshua even teaches his disciples to pray that the father's will is done. And we know this prayer, right? But he teaches us, he puts that in the prayer. The prayer is not that long. So you got to realize that part is pretty important. He said in Matthew 6, he says, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come and your will be done. Not my own. He's calling us and demanding us to have an attitude that says, put my will aside. What is it right now that you're wanting that God doesn't want? Where is your will and God's will? Are they in alignment? Is there something at war 
at battle where he's calling you to do more in some area, whether it be to uh, get closer to him. You know, sometimes it's nice to have God, but oftentimes most people don't want to be that close to God because to, we want to have God, but we don't want, we don't want God to have us. <laughs> I just want to have him, which means I can have him when I need help. I can have him when I need a blessing. I can have him when I'm in need. But for him to have me means that he tells me what to do. He's in control. I have to surrender. And it has to be that way in order for us to fully get the blessings. We surrender. Your will be done. Your will be done. I talked about in another lesson. This idea of his kingdom coming is like a takeover. He says, okay, I'm here now. I'm the king. I'm taking over. My will be done, not yours. I heard what you said. I see what you want, but I'm going to do what I want according to my will and my kingdom. We have to have this attitude if we're going to follow him. In Luke 22, uh, verse 41 we see this also uh, illustrated when he prayed in the garden and he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed saying, father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. We see, as we mentioned before, I don't want to drink this cup, but I'm willing to surrender that not my will, but your will. If there's any part in your life where you're fighting and you said, I don't want to surrender there. He said, you, you can't be my disciple. You can't say you're following me. Because I surrendered. I said, not my will, but yours. And I allowed it to happen. I've seen so many believers throw in the towel at this point. What point is that? When it got real painful, when it got real ugly, when things came down to it, tooth and nail, and people's attitudes came out, and you thought you just seen Satan himself. And you're like, okay, this is, no, this is not happening. Or things in the society with the government or the community or the world, or it just becomes too much. And here Yeshua is facing, a, um, drinking a bitter cup. We all going to have a bitter cup that we need to drink and it won't taste good. That's why it's bitter. And we need to say, like he says, not my will, but your will. If it's my will, I'm going to dilute that cup with a lot more water and add some sugar and honey. Because we say to ourselves, I'm a believer. I shouldn't have to go through this. Right. I shouldn't have to feel this way. And we feel entitled that we, we, we shouldn't have to uh, endure such pain. Something something in us said something's not right and we need to get out of this situation. But he says, no, your will be done. This is how it is and how it will be. Matthew six. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added. I left the word off. We'll be added. We'll be added unto you. First thing is his kingdom. Not your kingdom. Not your not not your righteousness. Right? Because my righteousness will will make things right according to me. Well, that feels about right. Well, that's a pretty good balance of good and evil. And we have these crazy standards we come up with in our own on our own minds. But he says, first seek his kingdom. First seek his righteousness. Number three. So the first two we talked about, if you want to follow him, you must you must realize you can do nothing by yourself. And secondly, you must put your will aside and follow his will. Yeshua did it. If you're saying you're following him, we must do the same. Third, we must pray often. We must pray often. My goodness. Um, Along with Bible study, prayer is one of those things that just doesn't happen. We love to 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 talk about how we are religious and um, to show up in so many ways uh, throughout the week with our groups and doing everything, doing different things, but praying often, actually praying, especially as much as Yeshua did. If he prayed and we're following him, we need to do the same thing. See, Yeshua was known. He was known to often withdraw and pray. And if we're his disciples, how can we not practice this? I know I've struggled in this area. Why? Because sometimes it's hard to see the, the, the power of prayer like i'm out i'm talking i'm no one's replying it seems no one knows um but over the years i've grown to enjoy it and look forward to it but it's been up and down it's not this strong consistent as i want it to be and i've seen that for a lot of those who are close to me 
Look at the Yeshua. It says in Luke 5, it says, But the news about Yeshua kept spreading all the more, so that huge crowds would gather to listen and be healed of their sickness. However, you know what he did? He made a practice, a practice of withdrawing to remote places in order to pray. All right, so here's the question. If I'm a disciple and I see the one I'm following doing this, is this something I'm known to do? Not that I need to make an announcement or something. Of course, he's not doing that. But is this a clear? People will know because you do it. Um, but is this something I'm known to do? Is this something I'm known by God to do? Do I do, am I in the practice of withdrawing to remote places to pray? This was his practice. Not that he did it once or twice. So there's a, there's a lot here, not just here or there. And he's going to remote places. So he's not just praying. It was a practice to go to somewhere remote. It's so comfortable to pray with people, right? Because the community, the encouragement, you're hearing people's prayers. You pray. It feels it feels great. His practice was otherwise. He spent most of his time alone. Alone. And the last it says in order to pray. Right. So sometimes we can want to be uh, efficient in our um, prayer and maybe like, while well, I'm out here, I'll do this, too. He says, no. I'm out here to pray. That is the only and sole reason I'm here. Not because I have some exercising to do over here, some shopping. No, no, I'm here to pray. That's the whole goal. Is this my attitude? Am I doing those three things? Am I practicing withdrawing uh, frequently? Am I going to remote places? And am I, is my sole intent to pray? If not, put that on your list. I, if I'm going to follow him and say I'm a disciple, shouldn't we also do the same thing? Or is this one of those things that we just simply say, oh, that's Yeshua. That's Jesus. He does that. Yeah, we probably should, too. And what kind of environment did he often pray? Well, we looked at it here just a second ago, but let's look at it again. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. At, and after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. Okay, are we getting the picture now? Now, remember, the Gospels don't record every single thing that happened. But we get a pretty clear indication that this was a practice he constantly did. We see it again. In a remote place, he's on a mountain. He's by himself, and his purpose is prayer. He's not kind of hiking, and while he's out there, I'm going to pray as well. No, I'm just there to pray. He was there alone. Well, that ain't no fun. I want to take a prayer partner with me or something. Not that you can't do that. But if you want to imitate Yeshua, he says, I often withdraw and pray to remote places. Do you have a remote place that you go to? Can you think of one that you can go to if you don't? Um, I would consider those things if you're wanting to follow Yeshua. On what occasions did he pray? Luke 6 and verse 12, it says, in these days he went out on the mountain to pray and all night he continued in prayer. And when he and when day came, oh, my goodness. So you want to talk about how long sometimes we look at our watch. You know, I would give myself I, I was um, I had a timer where I wanted to pray at least twice a day. And I feel so um, so um, immature at this. But I, I said, look, let's do 10 minutes, two times a day. 10 minutes, two times a day. <laughs> I put a timer on, one for morning, one afternoon, evening kind of time. And let me tell you, do you know I was struggling? I was struggling. I said, and it was a, such a good eye opener because I realized that prayer had not been a deep part of my life so that I would stop whatever I'm doing and make time to pray. I'm, I'm convicted at, at, I think it's the Muslim um, community who stop what they're doing at certain times. And I know, I don't believe in the, the God they serve and all the things, but the discipline to say, no, it's time to pray and I'm going to spend this time. And I'm saying two times for 10 minutes. I was struggling keeping the time. And then when I did make the time, I was struggling for 10 minutes sometimes. I said, this isn't good. I would go on prayer walks and have a good time. But sometimes the focus, what helped is I wrote some things down and I would have a prayer list to, to pray from. But I encourage you to come up with some practices where you're praying more frequently. This is Yeshua's um, habit. If we're going to follow him, we need to be praying. And when the day came, because it's been all night, he did more than 10 minutes. When day came, he and his disciple 
he called his disciples and chose them 12 chose from them 12 whom he named apostles why do i put this here because the next verse he chose his 12 disciples now is are those 12 disciples important in his plan absolutely absolutely important very pivotal so there's no wonder he stayed up all night it's likely because he was about to make a huge decision so in what cases did, on what occasions did yeshua pray he prayed all the time for one but particularly on these big moments he'd be up all night all night praying and now he had the clarity no i'm too tired now he's been praying all night he has the clarity to make a choice of those 12. How many big decisions have I made where I have not beseeched God? I have not um, basted in prayer more than two, three minutes. And I thought that was long just praying about it or anything for that matter. So he gives us an example of how we need to be if we're going to follow him. Pray and pray like this uh, um, for big decisions coming up. Job, relationships, um, how to handle the situations. Am I praying about it? Or am I thinking about it and getting the scripture? We spend so little time here. This is not the only occasion um, this, this happened where he prayed on, on such an occasion. Mark chapter 1 verse 29 says, Immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever. And when they told him about her, um, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And the fever left her, and she began to serve them. Now, I mention that because that context is important for what we're about to share in verse 32. Because that evening, it's evening time, at sundown, at sundown the good news spread. <laughs> Whoa, this, this woman was sick, and she got up the same day. And I haven't seen a doctor work like that in ever. So the evening, that evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick. Can you imagine a whole city of sick people? All the, the cities, all the sick. So it was the hospitals of the. Can you imagine all the hospitals being emptied, and they coming at the door? All who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. <laughs> at the door, they should have just called that the door ministries. I think somebody has that. The door, at the door, they were knocking and waiting to be healed. The hospitals of the day, if you will, of course, they likely had just the homes, were knocking at the door looking for a healing. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. Now, I want to highlight that he healed many. All came, but he healed many, which suggests that he didn't, which tells us that he didn't heal everybody. Now, it's not likely because he just um discriminated on them for some reason it was already sundown when they started to come so it was late and probably just got so late when you're dealing with a whole crowd but that's important again as we go into the next verse the next verse it says and rising very early in the morning look at that even though he had a long night of work of service of pouring himself out it was still dark do you want to follow yeshua he says i get up dark 30 and he departed and went out to a desolate place here he does it again we cannot say we're following yeshua if we're not following yeshua <laughs> we cannot say I'm, I'm a follower i'm a disciple we're not following him is this my practice do i get up dark 30 do i get up early in the morning and pray well i i do it this time of that time okay but this is what he did and he seemed to do it pretty consistently. Why not do the same? He seemed to know something we don't know. He departed and went out to a desolate place again. He didn't need a whole community. He didn't even need one other person. He wants it quiet there with him and Yahweh. And there he prayed. We see the same example. And watch what happens here. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said, Everyone is looking for you. Why? Because the night ended and they're probably looking for the rest to be healed. They're looking for him. Not just the disciples likely, but the rest of the town who, who was wanting to continue um, what they started that evening. They're looking for him. 
What are you doing leaving right now? You should have known that people are going to look looking for you. You got responsibilities here. If you were Yeshua, what would you do? What would you do? You got a town full of people who are still sick, demon possessed. And you, with a touch or a word, can take away their ailments. Here's what Yeshua says. He said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. Wow. Why is that so uh, huge as we read that? Because you do realize you're leaving people there in this town sick. You do realize you're leaving people there demon possessed. You do realize my niece and my nephew, my mom and my uncle did not get a chance to encounter the holy uh, uh, power that comes from God through you. And you just left. I thought that he who knows the good and doesn't do his sins. Don't you see good that can be done here and you should do it? And you left these people at the door looking. How brazen, how inconsiderate again to, for you to say, let's go. No, let's take care of these people. Can you just wave your hand over this city and make it be done? You see, you see, again, Yeshua had just proceeded with prayer. Much clarity. It was time to go. And I love to see this because there are times when we need to turn from what seems to be the good thing and do the God thing. Everyone um, would have challenged him today saying you're wrong how do you have the cure for cancer and you're not going to give it and you have people with cancer right here and there why leave because sometimes god calls us to leave because it's time to go and not everyone will be healed i'm gonna say that again not everyone will be healed it's time to leave to the next place there is a such uh a, it is a thing that you would be given that option to say I have to go, even though I can do something that is good. And I use the word good um, tongue in cheek a little bit because God only tells us what's good. It would have actually been wrong for Yeshua to stay because that is not God's will. He is now doing his will and operating according to his understanding. And it's so easy for us to do that and say, this is uh, in the spirit of God in the name. But if we really listen, God would tell us to say, no, it's time to go. But that's mean. That's not right. In this case, it was. And it, in many cases in our lives, that would be the that would be the situation. But we are only going to be able to discern that by prayer, by meditation, by listening to God and understanding what his will is. Not simply following an idea of what we think is right and what feels good at the moment. Sometimes we'll pass up someone who needs help because we need to go to the next place. And that's right to do as we see Yeshua doing here. But it only helps. It helps us when we have the, that level of prayer in our lives that we can make that discernment. And lastly, we need to live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, though Yeshua himself was the word and the word says so, he teaches his followers, followers to have a daily diet of the word. He teaches us that it's important for us to know and wield his word appropriately. I have studies about the word of God, because although many um, um, claim to be followers and disciples and Christians and such, there's such a epidemic of ignorance when it comes to his word for the Christian community. I'm not talking about for those who don't know him in that way and don't proclaim to be seeking the kingdom of God. I'm talking about those who say I'm a believer. We have such a, a void when it comes to understanding, or to knowing, let alone understanding his word. And it doesn't seem uh, necessary, but Yeshua shows us differently. If you claim it to follow him, he says this has this can't be because he's shown us that he understands and knows the word very well and calls us to use it. One of my favorite places to go to highlight this is in the desert before he started his ministry and being tempted by Satan. He responded to Satan each and every one of his temptations with scripture. Then Yeshua was led up by the spirit, by the spirit 
took him there <laughs> into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after forty fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, there's so much here. He was able to quote the scriptures. He was able to say what you're saying is not right. You're challenging my identity, first of all, by saying, if you are the son of God, excuse me, if I'm the son of God, I don't need to prove anything to you. I know who I am because of the word of God. He can quote the scripture and say it's written. Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Do you know his word and do you understand it well enough that you can quote it during such times of temptation and difficulties for yourself or for others? He continues with another temptation. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. Hmm. Satan knows scripture as well and can and will use it to do his bidding. Wow. Well, so those movies aren't right where you hold up, you, 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 you flail the Bible, Bible in the air and you get the spirits to go away. And he says, no, I'm going to quote the scripture. I will open my mouth and speak it. He says, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. Yeshua said to him, again, it is written every time. Notice he's not saying you wrong. You shouldn't talk like that. That's mean. Something's not right about that. I hate your attitude. He literally just says, the scriptures say, you shall not put Yahweh your God to the test. So we see that in Satan knows scripture, but how does he use it out of context? He twists it and turns it, saying things that he really say this. Is that really what this means? See, we can have uh, um, just like we have disciples of Yeshua. We can have disciples of Satan in the pulpits of churches teaching things that should not be taught. Do not be deceived in thinking that because they have a Bible and because they say it is written. That they speak from God. They don't speak all the time in his will because it requires context and understanding. And it's not true. So we must be careful not to just know, but to understand that some of us are at a serious disadvantage right now because all we know has come from the mouth of other people. We have not done the hard work that it takes to open up the scriptures and learn for ourselves to understand the context. And we don't have a daily diet of his word which we'll come back to in a minute when, um, from that first when he spoke of when he says, man should not live on bread alone. And the devil took him to a very high place and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And then Yeshua said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, be gone on these grounds. <laughs> you shall worship Yahweh your God and him only shall you serve. Be gone. Each time Yeshua responded with the word. Each time. Again, he is the word. He could have spoken anything and it would have popped up as read in our scriptures. Because that's the word. But he chose to use the written word from Deuteronomy um, and, and other places. And Psalms, uh, uh, Satan uses one in Psalms. But he's using scripture. Why are we so big and bad and smart and bold? And so pious and religious that we think we can do otherwise. When he says, I can do nothing on my own. He says, no, let me just quote what's here. Are we doing otherwise? He needed to be well versed in the scriptures and understand his context and meaning so that he is not led astray and he won't lead others astray. We need the same thing. All right. As promised, let's revisit one of the, the, the first one that he spoke of. Coming from Deuteronomy 8. Speaking of the people in the desert for those 40 years, God says, uh, Moses um, writing this says, and he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone. But man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. 
Man does not live on bread alone. Um, we need to eat food for our bodies to live. But I wish we had an x-ray, like a spiritual x-ray, right? They could actually see our spiritual development. Like you can look at somebody's body and tell, are they taking care of it? Are you eating well or not? You can look at that and see. But spiritually, are we emaciated and lacking? You can't see it that clearly. Now, you can see from the fruits. Yeshua talks about and judge them from the fruits. But what if it was that clear? And we could take a snapshot picture and see the healthiness of our spiritual bodies. You know, we have to live on the bread, the, the spiritual manna. Too many are satisfied. Too many of us are satisfied with crumbs. We're snacking on God's word. Just getting a little bit here, a little bit there to satisfy and appease our conscience. Because we know we should be reading. We know we should be deeper in it. So we pull up the scripture of the day. Or we pull up a quick verse here or there. And we think about it. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if that's the, the vastness of your diet, you're not going to be prepared. You're not going to be following Yeshua who consumed this so much that he can quote it and understand it. So we can't say we're following him if we're just wanting the snack. If we're filling our bellies with all of the other social media, all of the mu music and movies, memorizing all the other songs and all these other things. But we a little bit here, we're nibbling on God's word. And we've gotten to the point where we lack the appetite, the spiritual appetite for God's word. We don't even hunger for it now. You know, Yeshua talked about he, he hungers. His food is to do his will. I'm just hungry for it. But we get to a point we've we're filled ourselves up so much from the morning to evening with the world stuff. There's no more room. You know how it is when you eat uh, the desserts before dinner or you fill yourself up with something else that isn't the, the main meal. We don't have any more room. And this is our state that shouldn't be. Some are fully relying on listening to, to other uh, weekly sermons and preachers and showing up weekly and saying, this is what I eat. Once a week, that's what you eat? And you snack for the rest of the week? And you think that you're following Yeshua? And you think that you can still say, I'm a follower? I'm a Christian? I'm a disciple? I'm a, a Hebrew I'm a crossed over one. If we want to cross over, we need to cross over and actually follow him. Um, uh, think about what your 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 bodies will look like. Um, I hired a uh, fitness instructor who is a four time weightlifting champ, huge guy. And after being trained for five or six months and he him coaching me, um, I learned that building that body takes time. I know. I know. It's obvious, right? But it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of intentional time uh, in the gym and a lot of intentional time eating. I had to hit certain numbers uh, for my protein. I have to spend at least an hour and a half, sometimes two hours a day, five to six days a week in the gym. Every single one of those days. Try not to miss because you constantly need to feed your body this uh, this food and also this exercise. And it hit me recently that it's the same for us spiritually. What's happening to our bodies if we're not feeding it? If we're not if we're only giving it snacks here and there, we're not spiritually astute. We must have the attitude that it says here. Man cannot live on bread alone. You have to consume. Are you making the time? OK, let me just ask it that way, because we can really see where we are with the time. How much time are you spending in his word? All right. That's the first question. How much time? It's an easy, quantifiable question every day. How much time? Do you believe in your own spirit that that's adequate? Before you and God, just between you and God, do you believe that this is adequate? Or are there some excuses to explain why you can't do more? I'll be careful with those excuses because when we look throughout the day and find us doing other things, we're saying that these things are more important. I don't want to put a number. I don't put a time on it that says because we can't. There's, he never said you have to do this or that so many minutes or whatever. But our own spirits will testify against us and say something's not right. There's guilt here. 
we can look at um, Yeshua and I, if he was with us and say, okay, this is off. Let's repent in this area if you're not. Now, if we're not spending the time, let's spend the time. But even more so, now let's get understanding. Let's go deeper and actually be in the word, study, and put it into practice. Even to the point where we can teach now others to do the same. In John 6, Yeshua says, I am the bread of life. We're talking about manna. You know, these people wanted something to eat. And he says, I am the bread. Your answers is ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they die. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Some of us need to consider fasting. So that the hunger pains in our stomach remind us to fill our spiritual stomachs with his word. So we can have eternal life. I, I, we all enjoy eating, especially our favorite foods. But we make sure we need to make sure that our favorite food is on the top of that list is God's word. Love, love getting into it. Um, the studies like this do help. But let this not be the, the um, main course. Let this be an appetizer that uh, quickens your appetite that says, I want more. I want to go deeper. I want to learn more. I want to know God's mind and his heart and understand him. Whatever it is, there's so much to know. Over 20 years, I've been walking in this faith and I've never found his word to be mundane and boring because it's so much application. It truly is living and active, as Hebrews 4 says. All right, as we close for for Yeshua patterns. We should also practice. We just covered one. Well, realize you can do nothing without God's authority. You can do nothing without him. Um, the Holy Spirit doesn't speak without him. Yeshua says, I only do what I see my father doing. Do you have this attitude? If we're going to follow him, we need to have that same attitude. I only do what I see him doing. I can do nothing without. He didn't give me authority to do that, to say that, to think that. That's what, that's the land I'm going to stay in. Number two, we need to seek his will, not our own. Seek his will. What does he want? And in order to understand that, we're going to have to be in prayer and we're going to have to be in his word. See, all this comes together. And notice we didn't get into a lot of details about what he dressed like this. He walked this many miles. He healed this many people. He fed them because that wasn't the point. It may be different for us today versus the next day. But if we're if we're grounded in his his uh, his will and we're sitting at his feet. And we're surrendering, saying, your will, not my will. We're in prayer and we're in his word. His will for us, for you, will become obvious. Don't just copy and paste without um, thinking through, is this what he wants for me to do? It's easy for us to say, okay, Peter did that, so I'm going to do that. Um, yeah, Yeshua went to that city, so I'm going to go to that city. That's not his will for you. It may not be his will. Well, this man gave up that, so I'm going to give up that. Well, what is his will for you? Um, Spending that time in prayer, spending that time in his word will make that clear. Guys, as usual, thanks for tuning in. Um, May Yahweh bless you. May he keep you. And I'll see you next lesson.